Hey, and welcome to another installment of I Want to Tell You, which is a Beatles podcast, because we want to tell you about our favorite Beatles music, or favorite, or at least how, I mean, shit, we, we talk about all the Beatles songs, but, you know. We do. Track by track, even the crappy ones, Revolution 9, we'll get you, we'll get to you. I, I There'll be a whole episode devoted to that motherfucker. Yeah, just burning it. But the, um, every, trying to find every track of that tape. Um. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, we're uh, so yeah we go album by album, track by track, and joining me, of course, is my buddy and fellow Beatles aficionado, Jake. Thank you, sir. Uh, today we'll be talking about the third Beatles album, A Hard Day's Night. Ooh, we're getting good. Yeah. Now let me put it this way. I love Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Of course. I love Magical Mystery Tour. I love Abbey Road. I mm-hmm. love Revolver. I love Rubber Soul. But there is something about this album. Maybe it's the nostalgia because it's the first full Beatles album I ever owned. It wasn't on. It wasn't like I had the compilations first, but then in terms of studio albums, this was the first one. Maybe it's because it was the first Beatles album I ever owned. Maybe it's because it's the first Beatles album without any covers at all. Maybe it's because it's the only Beatles album where Ringo Starr doesn't sing at all. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And also, Lennon like slays it on this one. He does. This is like the last major Lennon album. Yeah. Like he still has significant songwriting in, in the next, like, three or four albums. Shining moments, you know, definitely here and there. But, yeah, I mean, this is one you look at, um, even for a guy where, like, McCartney's in there, too, like, but he just dominates this album. This is, I think, Lennon's possibly his best album. It's the soundtrack to their best film, in my opinion, A Hard Day's Night. Yeah, I agree, too. I mean, for, for nostalgia purposes, because we've been talking about nostalgia a lot, and I think as we go on with these albums we'll be talking about, how powerful nostalgia is for everything, you know, uh, on catching up. We talk about that a lot too, but yeah, for me, I mean, help is always my favorite, but yeah, I mean, hard day's night is, as they say, like that's a landmark film, you know? Yeah. Landmark film showed that it, up until then it was just, you know, kind of those cheap, almost beach ball movies with yeah. Elvis Presley. This was what, you know, showed that like a you day could, in the life of the Beatles. Yeah. You could make a good movie about a band, about a popular act. And I think it also helps, like, so much with, with their chemistry. You know, these are four guys who have been living, breathing, doing everything together for, for years, or, you know, for a couple of years at this point, with Ringo joining in, uh, you know, like, what, 62. But, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you, you get uh, just this sense of fun. I mean, you can't watch that movie without just having a huge smile on your face. And it's not just when the music kicks in. You yeah. know, it's, just, it's a legitimately funny movie. It's, a, it's just a portrait of these four guys just, like, trying to make the most of... Basically having no, like, social life. Yeah, that it, moment when they're just sitting in the hotel room with just all the letters and they can't leave, you know? Yeah, I mean, so always, much of that. Yeah, write all the fan mail yeah, back. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, when their manager pulls them out of the nightclub or when they finally get that, you know, that gasp of freedom and get to run and play around. Oh, that's one of the great moments, yeah. Yeah, so iconic. But uh, th- this, you know, we'll, we'll be talking about the, um, we'll be talking about the, uh, the, the, the album itself. Maybe one day we'll go back and touch on the film. Sure. That's worth its own conversation. We'll certainly mention moments in the film because the entire first side of this album is songs that appear in the film. Um, the second side, I feel like the second side doesn't get enough credit, be, probably because it isn't in the fucking movie, but um, a lo- most of those tracks are fucking phenomenal tracks. They're like, you've got, like, if the first side is bouncy, happy Beatles about falling in love, the second side is about falling out of it mm-hmm. because it's very dark. It's very atmospheric. That's the kind of music I think of when I think like n- black and white, nineteen early 1960s London, just those smoky back rooms and everything. It just has that tone. I just love that stuff so much. Ooh, boy. So let's just like, you know, this album came out in the summer of 1964. It's like the height of Beatlemania. They've already made it. Big on the other side of the Atlantic. They've already had their number one single as a band of all time over in the UK, which is She Loves You, which they play in the film, but it doesn't actually show up on the album because it had already been released as a, as a single. Um, yeah, they are at the height of their powers, and on top of their nonstop touring and public appearance schedule, on top of all that, on, t- on top of filming a movie, they have to write an album to go along with that film and to make sure they keep the lion's share of the songwriting royalties and the performance royalties, it all has to be original material. And the fact that they can put out 13 original songs within such a short amount of time under that much pressure and for it to be so good. I will say most British LPs at that time were only it were had to be 14 tracks. This one's only 13. They kind of like, oh... They're yeah. revolutionaries, though. They can do whatever they want. Yeah, it's like, oh, we don't, Trailblazers. We don't have to do 14. Yeah. I'll give me your 14 tracks, smack yeah. 13. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's a Beatles joint. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, the, and what opening chord is more iconic than the opening chord to the title track, "A Hard Day's Night"? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's uh, kind of the one of the perfect uh, moments in, in Beatles history. If we go, if we're charting that, which we kind of are, uh, uh, just that opening is is fantastic. I mean, it's one of those. To get off real quick uh, topic, there's the movie um, uh, Nowhere Boy with uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson as a young John Lennon, which is a fantastic film, by the way. And it's a fantastic film because it's not about the Beatles at all. It's about John Lennon. It's about John meeting Paul as well. But anyway, really good. But the great thing is the one taste of Beatles music you get is the first note of the movie is the, is the note that we get to start the album with A Hard Day's Night, and then it cuts into like Lennon's childhood. Um, so it's kind of the perfect way to start it off. But yeah, I mean, the the... The opening is this this kind of clangy, bombastic kind of we've arrived, even though they've arrived multiple times before that. But kind of the, the same thing with like, you know, we were talking about how fast bands had to put out music. And this will this will cut into something later as we get closer to like the Sgt. Pepper era. Like if you weren't putting out music on a regular insane shift, like, like you know, in a couple months, not years for albums, but a couple months and and they were just just rolling it's just crazy the amount of, of stuff they're putting out and and yeah. the quality yeah the quality up until this point anyway had uh i mean certainly including this stuff had never dipped yeah i mean i'd say um, it's you know it's it, it's only gotten better you know the three yeah. albums we've done so far yeah this there's a progression we'll talk about the next album when we get to the next album yeah, yeah. but <laughs> like for now yeah it's constantly getting better and that opening chord i always heard it was a uh, f major with a g on top i always heard that they had no idea what it was. Like it was like a hodgepodge of multiple chords sound. So it was on uh, you. Could, like, another great hallmark of the Beatles. So much of what they did, you couldn't do again. And then that's not, that's not just to say, oh, they were the Beatles. Like the Beatles couldn't do it again because right. the way they would record it, just that perfect snapshot. That perfect snapshot. And I think that opening chord I've always heard is just this, this, this this chemistry you know well, it's, uh, like, it's like when symphonies like warm up you know they're you know with the strings and everything yeah it's it's just this perfect chaotic moment kind of perfectly of what the beatles were experiencing at the time you know the amount of fandom and like crazy beatlemania that was going on whatever it was the i mean we do know it was recorded on a four track which was a first first off was like basically brand new technology for recording artists mm-hmm. we yeah. take that for granted now like you can oh, record sure, on yeah. however many fucking channels you want now yeah <laughs> but uh, well yeah. we were we were in a studio recently and just to see how much you could do in the studio now like and yeah. how the wizardry of the producer and, and putting everything together and doing this and that oh, yeah and the machine off to the side was only like a 26 channel recorder yeah. and now it's like oh yeah. but yeah it, it, i mean they were using a four track george harrison in, influenced by the uh, i believe by the, his friends the birds the birds yeah he's using a 12 string rickenbacker now mm-hmm. uh, which he keeps for both at least this album and the and the next album uh, beatles for sale mm-hmm. um, and that's a great thing too like the Beatles inspired so many people, but the Beatles still allowing themselves to, be to bring, yeah, be inspired, you know, and you know, so much ent- of that. The photo session for this album, John Lennon, not counting the uh, cover, but how iconic is that fucking cover? Oh, yeah. I the, love a Harrison really doesn't really change much. That's yeah. just such a Harrison thing. Well, he's know? got the one where he's like, his yeah, back his is back. to the camera, yeah. camera, so you just see the back of his head. Sure. Um, you've got, uh, is it Ringo that, I feel like Ringo is the one that gives the least a shit on the cover. He's like smoking in one of the, one of the shots in one of the frames. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, like Paul makes the goofy face and you've got like John, like pointing at the camera and stuff like, yeah. like John's kiss. like, this is my masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> um, but jo- during the, like the photo sessions, you can see him like when they're like in this iconic pictures of them running through London, like John Lennon's wearing the Bob Dylan hat. Sure. So yeah. He's certainly taking cues from him at that point. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, we're, we haven't really got there yet, but it's getting close to that point of like the folk Dylan or the folk Lennon folk era. Beatles, yeah. yeah folk we'll Beatles. see that in a couple albums, but yeah. But the seeds are planted there. Definitely. Yeah. With, with, with that, just the hat, you know? Yeah. Cause they had already, you know, they had met Lennon when they first got over to the UK or first got over to the U S and you know, it was all, all from there. But yeah, hard day's night. That's such a, just a fucking like the, it, it matches the energy of the film. And the entire first side of the album, just kind of like as fast as you can, just like, you know, can't stop because you're being chased by hordes of women or sure. you, and you've got a schedule to keep. It's just, uh, you know, the title uh, famously is kind of coined by Ringo, who after a lengthy recording session, steps out of the recording studio saying, man, it's been a hard day and notice that it's, you know, it's been so long that it's nighttime. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, it's night. Yeah, you got uh, the, like these yogi-isms from, from uh, Ringo. Well, I think he... D- he 
kind of helps with some other stuff later on. Um, oh yeah, certainly when we get to like Revolver. Yeah, yeah, with some of those great titles. Yeah, but uh, you know, so it, it's it's phenomenal. The, uh, you know, I, I'm not the best guitarist in the in the whole wide world, but I do like try to like learn some of the Beatles songs. Never been able to pick up the uh, the uh, solo. Mm-hmm. I never try with solos. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I again, I'm. It's, just a amateur at best guitarist and the the thing i always liked was the rhythms that they create with this and the beatles are cool too because a lot of like songs you learn you're like oh this is the cool part i'm gonna learn this part this is the coolest part but when you look at a lot of especially the early beatles stuff all of it's the cool part you know what i mean the bass part is gonna be this um underrated gem every time you know uh, and again, even though I don't really learn the solos, but there are these solos that, again, you can sing, you can hum along to. And they're not these like daunting, like, oh, my God, here comes this like, you know, insane shred filled mess. Um, and then just the rhythm stuff, too. You're just it's impossible to tap your foot along to. Yeah, it's just it's a great album opener. Uh, apparently, it took uh, even after he wrote it, it, took Harrison a couple hours to get that uh, to get that solo down because yeah. it's a very, you know, it's a very complex solo and it matches the kind of pace and just energy of the uh of the album or of the track so yeah i mean again to say that like you know i think a big misconception that we'll probably uh, touch on a couple times and with ringo's drumming is like complexity isn't in always in speed and ferocity um you know it's in not not the amount of notes no exactly exactly and it's it's uh, you know so much of it can be just that that perfect final touch that makes the song great. Having said that, I think Harrison is severely underrated as a guitarist. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I mean that's what I was going for. Yeah, I mean, like, very he's, technically proficient. It's it's the technically proficient stuff, and it's uh, that he can surround. You know, the Beatles are just for me the first thing I think of all the time, every time, is the melodies. You know, and and sure. to have a Lennon McCartney melody, and then to come in with like this kind of melody of your own. Yeah, I mean, and again, I think a lot of it is like. You look at a Leonard McCartney track, for example. This is definitely, I mean, they're sh- they're sharing the vocals. Like McCartney's hitting those high notes on this one, and, and that's yeah, that is for me. I think you know, I think there's so many things to talk about the Beatles that like some things are always going to be left out or not talked about as much. But the thing I love about the do du- the dual vocal stuff is when Le- when McCartney does the high vocal harmony stuff, and that's something we'll get to in a couple albums for sure. Like that's my favorite part of an album down the line. But yeah, just I. Th- in sync you know the Beatles are so in sync with each other yeah that's you know having lived in a basically just basically with each other on the road for and in the studio for for over a year at this point yeah it's kind of they are dialed in because they've been sharing that that much like just living space for that long they're so dialed into each Mm -hmm. other absolutely the next track uh is the um so this obviously kicks off the uh the the film the second track I should have known better uh, you know, it's a it's a Lennon track. There, uh, it's when they're hanging out in the train, and you see George Harrison's future wife, yeah, and Eric Clapton's Daddy. future wife at a separate time. Yep, uh, in the uh, in the train car with him. Uh, I think it's the uh, if it's not the last time we hear Lennon use a harmonica on a Beatles track, it's pretty damn close. It's yeah, certainly well, it's, the last it's time we hear it on this album. The last really like yeah, if iconic kind of thing you could think of. But yeah, I mean, it's it's again, it's a great melody. It's a great moment in the movie too. They kind of just again exhausted escaping all this craziness and they kind of go in and they kind of just sit down and start jamming you know yeah i mean it, it it's a it's a real toe tapper it's kind of yeah it's a good one it's got that lennon thing that i always love where like he finishes a phrase and he goes a little higher a little bit higher like he makes it a like a seven syllable word you yeah. know like i i've always i've always loved that lennon thing you know it's it's great yeah no the next track is a uh, i mean it's another big uh, it's another lennon number again mm-hmm. very lennon heavy um, probably the best Lennon heavy album. I mean, certainly my favorite. Oh yeah, I would, I would definitely say. But it's the, the best, uh, best of that. The next one is kind of like a ballad. You know, it it, it definitely changes the pace. It's uh, it's sung by Evan Rachel Wood in Across the Universe. Oh, it's so good. Honestly, that's my favorite part of the film. You know what? Um, there's a couple really great standout tracks on that. I think uh, with a little help from my friends yeah. is fantastic. Just the the like. Uh, the fun and just escapism of that song, but yeah, her if I fell, um, which I'm assuming is what you're talking about. Yes, because uh, I don't, I can't remember all these track listings on my head. But uh, if I Neither fell, I. yeah, but that's part of the secret. We're <laughs> pretending like you can. Um, if I fell, put it out there. It's my favorite track on the album. Um, I, I, the harmonies on this song. I, I love the the ballad because 
Lennon always has there's a there's a real darkness to his ballads. Yeah. And this is no exception. I mean, he's the most insecure of the four. Yeah, and it just he wears yeah. that more on his sleeve as the band progresses. The, yeah, the harmonies in this one are just uh, are freaking astounding. I love it. And yeah, yeah and, and and every even Rachel Woods version is a is a standout. Along with it won't be long because we just talked about that. Sure, but uh, it's uh, an in, it's a uh, in it's an uh, unusual choice for the film. He uh, it's presented in the film as he sings it to Ringo when Ringo gets annoyed that somebody messes with his drums. Yeah, like, hey, it's okay. It's okay. I'm gonna sing if this. I if I fell, if I fell in love with you, <laughs> he's singing as a snare drum. Yeah, to Ringo. No, but I, you know, and another funny thing that I always thought was really kind of just perfect is that George Harrison slips on his amp and like falls during the song "If I Fell," which I was, and I, it's so great that they left it in. But I always thought that was really funny. But yeah, you get this like kind of like he picks up his acoustic guitar and it's like over almost like on top of Ringo like it's okay buddy we've had the, you know we're all it's okay Ringo it's gonna be okay yeah uh no it, it's it's a beautiful track beautiful ballad absolutely uh, this is one of those uh albums where I think uh, you know honestly the uh as good as the up tempo songs are the down tempo songs are as good if not better sure yeah um, and, and this is a prime example another of that. St- another staple another Beatles staple is that you know if you're gonna give it to them uh as kind of raw and and fantastic and in your face um you know the the more kind of dark sad kind of uh slower moments are going to be just as hard hitting yeah now ringo did record a track for this album he recorded matchbox um you know as his singing song as a as what they were trying to write him into the film for but uh you know the, I, I guess the producers weren't too pleased with it or they didn't have the place for it so that got pushed off to an ep we'll talk about down the line mm-hmm. long tall sally but uh Ooh, yeah uh, they did write a song for Harrison that he performed that gets to stay in the film, and that's uh, I'm Happy Just to Dance With You, which is the only time Harrison takes the lead vocals for this entire album. And again, he he he's not writing this one. He wrote his he had his songwriting debut in the last album with the Beatles, and we don't see him write again for, for a couple, for a while, I think. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's just the amount of times we've listened to Beatles songs over and over again, but it's funny that even when it's a song Harrison doesn't write, it kind of feels like he wrote it. Yeah. They were as much as John Lennon kind of dismisses the songs that he himself, that he writes, but doesn't sing. He, kn- he does know how to write to Harrison's strengths. Uh, yeah, I think so. I like think he, he, they know to, how to write to, to Ringo's strengths with a little help, you know? Yeah. Uh, or they changed, Yellow that, Submarine. changed the lyrics for him. So it wasn't the, tomatoes hitting him in the face or whatever the that yeah. alternate lyric but um yeah because <laughs> she's like yeah, i've been doing it for years yeah. <laughs> hit me for years with that uh but yeah this is a i mean the title says it all it's just this kind of like fun upbeat kind of track especially after yeah if i fell i will say it's the track that's most likely that would have been the most likely to appear on with the beatles or please please me yeah it kind of yeah. has that same kind of sensibility to it mm-hmm. um but yeah it, it, it's a fun little number and uh you can see uh I think a big part of it's kind of confidence too. Like George Harrison proved he could, to himself he could write a song, but I still don't think he felt inco- entirely comfortable doing it. Yeah, I mean it had to be. And they have to kind of, if you look at his perf- they, when they mime the performance in the in the film, they kind of have to coax him to kind of like dance and like not just kind of like plant and play. Yeah. Well, it ha- it ha- again, it had to be so freaking daunting. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. To be in that band and especially be in that movie because. What kind of was a great? And I don't think Paul and and John help. There's no. a reason why he comes out with a triple album. As no, soon as the Beatles yeah. Break I up. mean, yeah. There's, there's, it, it. That's kind of a. That's always kind of a bummer. But yeah, I mean, it's kind of great that like the star of the Beatles movies for the most part is like Ringo. You know that he kind of gets his yeah. thing. I think um, he was the best actor of them. I think so as well. Yeah, and he kind of is the only one who really kept it. Try to keep it going. Yeah, Cape Man. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, like I said, we'll say it a million times. He landed a Bond girl, man. Yeah. Uh, but. You know, it's uh, it, it had to be tough for Harrison, especially yeah, you get thrown in front of the camera. You got Lennon and McCartney who are like far and away at the time. You he know, has the, the most satirical the moment in the film, though. Yeah, when he's like criticizing like the teen idol that they've propped up. And he's oh, like, absolutely. Yeah, nobody takes her seriously. He's also got some of the best things too, when he's like asking about his hairstyle and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. But I mean, uh, but yeah, it, it's a fun little number. Yeah. Uh, I would say it is probably the weakest. Uh, song on side one though yeah i'd say that's uh, uh the next track we get is uh is mccartney's ballad oh boy. which shows up in the film and i love her Ooh, uh, that's good too yeah where uh, harrison's employing the spanish guitar yeah i mean yeah I, yeah my two favorite tracks and this are probably the most kind of like down tempo down tempo but this is uh i mean lennon's i mean McC- mccartney's got plenty of moments in the previous ones but this i think is a big 
like step. leap. Yeah, I think it's a big step for him. At this point, he's dating Jane Asher, so he's yeah. got kind of a muse. To yeah, I, yeah, I mean that makes sense too. I mean, and I was kind of maybe you know, it's, even though it's not really a, a Lennon song, what do you think inspired Lennon with this outburst of like just nonstop creativity? I mean, again, throughout the Beatles albums, he has these great shining beacon moments are of just brilliance but what do you think about this album in particular that he just was like this he had so much great stuff uh i think um and we'll get back to the song in a second yeah i think he had finally gotten uh confident enough as a songwriter yeah because he's you know the last album with the beatles he's forced to to write material he can't rely on covers as much um and you know this is kind of the his last gasp of songs in that style but in doing so he's he's being he's able to kind of advance what that style is Mm -hmm. he's also um so not only is he starting to become a he's comfortable with becoming a pioneer not just aping you know muddy waters or all the Smokey robinson all the people he's admiring he's also i mean technology is working to their favor now i mean sure they had some overdubs in the first two albums, but they had to use them sparingly, very sparingly, because at the time, overdubs were as expensive as all hell. Sure. Um, Technology hasn't caught up to the Beatles yet. Yeah. I think having a four-track you know, for this album definitely helps. You mm-hmm. know, they, they, they can... New toy to play with. Yeah. It, it, it's great. And they've got more time. They have more time recording this album than they do not... I mean, they're not not huge amounts, not like Sgt. Pepper's amounts, where they can be in the studio for months and months and months. Yeah. But uh, the better part of like 1966 and seven, but mm-hmm. the uh, they can. Uh, I really do think he's starting to become confident. I think the pressures of fame will start will catch up with him, starting on the next album, yeah. and especially with the album after that. Yeah, and that's kind of a a bummer. I, you know, again, he never he may waver, but he never falls. You know, like yeah. he's always got a one two punch in there somewhere. But anyway, going he's back, still to, riding high. Sure, absolutely, um, and not just literally high, but um. No, the weed comes. <laughs> weed comes soon. Yeah, but uh, and I love her. We're talking about Harrison's guitar work on this. You know, just in general. Yeah, uh, this is uh, one of the uh, on the d- more down tempo songs. He's not using the twelve string, he, and again, yeah, he's using a Spanish guitar yeah. with this. Some song. of my favorite of his stuff is, is the Spanish guitar stuff on this. Yeah, I, I, again, simple but exactly what the song needed. Yeah, beautiful number. Yeah. Beautiful number. I'll actually put it over if I fell. And I'm generally speaking, I'm more of a Lennon guy, but. This is the, the this har- is yeah, harmonies are what pushes it over the edge for me. Yeah. If, if I fell, it might be my favorite song on the album. Certainly my favorite song on side one. That's in- wait, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah it's, it's between that for side one. It's between yeah. this and the title track. Yeah, yeah. Um, de- and it's definitely my favorite McCartney composition. Uh, the other one, the next track is a uh, is a um, Lennon composition. Uh, it's the, also one of the few because even though again Harrison is there. He doesn't provide backing vocals a whole hell of a lot on this album, um, but this is one of the tracks where he does. Uh, Tell me why. Yeah. Um, they have that weird moment in Tell Me Why where it's like <laughs> they hit that like falsetto, and I can't keep a straight face yeah. every time I hear the song or see it, like you know, see the film. Uh, this song, you know, crops up while they're uh, in the the climactic concert. Yeah. Well, it's um, funny because the reason I'm laughing is like. This isn't the song that made me ask the question to my dad, but it was actually uh, in my life. But the falsetto stuff, when I was a kid, like really young, getting to like the Beatles and Springsteen and stuff, I didn't understand how you could sing that high. And I went to my dad because like my dad is, what you know, you a fatherly figure, you ask him the questions, you expect him to hear or fatherly answers. And I went, dad, how do the Beatles sing that high? He looked at me and he goes, they don't have testicles. And I was like, fair enough. That's a dad answer. All right. Yep. He's the you know <laughs> not the biggest, <laughs> not the world's biggest Beatles fan. Did Although he famously turned the White Album into a pretzel bowl. Or yeah. At a party bowl? once, uh, they ran. They didn't have a bowl for chips for some reason, and so someone was playing the White Album on repeat like over and over again. And he was like, "Enough of this shit!" So he took it out of the the, the, off, the turntable. off the turntable, put it on top of a. Uh, I guess this wouldn't make any sense. Because they already had a bowl to do it, but he put it on top of a bowl, put it in the oven, it melted on top of the bowl. He took it out and he goes, "There's your fucking bowl." <laughs> he didn't say it like that, but like, yeah, he he was he like, turned into a bowl. He, he turned the white album into a bowl. Yeah. And I was like, "Cool, but why the white album?" And then also, uh, well, he because he didn't have "Let It Be" available. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> oh, he wouldn't even know the difference. But uh, uh, no, but he, he is though. I will say a big Harrison fan because he's like a, a massive Traveling Wilburys fan. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, honestly, like, uh, I don't know if I've said this on this show or catching up before, but, um, like, my gateway into the Beatles was the Traveling Wilburys. Nice, yeah. Because my dad's a huge, one of his favorite. I think everyone's dad, whether they know it or not, is a massive Traveling Wilburys well, fan. Well, in, in particular, his uh, favorite, uh, one of his favorite singers of all time is Roy Orbison. Same with my dad. Sure, yeah, they should bro out, but the <laughs> yeah. uh, they both used to work for the same company, both used to be in the Army. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your dad would probably never see Halloween. But <laughs> no, he does not give a shit about Halloween. <laughs> My dad walked out of that film. but yeah. the uh, He fell asleep during Return of the Jedi, I found out recently. Oh. Yeah, it was a date between my mom and my dad, obviously. And they went to go see it because it was like the thing to do at the time. Sure. And my mom. Yeah, because uh, everyone's raving about Return of the Jedi. And my mom's watching it and just still to this day being like, you know, every time she has to ask me who is Darth Vader, like, is the father and so um although she swears she's getting it now like my goal would be to take her to see episode seven that would be the greatest thing in the world anyway she's like wondering you know it's the date blah, blah, blah. if my dad is enjoying the movie she looks over he's asleep and he falls forward and smacks his head into the chair in front of him and wakes and like not wakes up a bunch of people because not a bunch of people sleeping during the jedi but that's my mom and dad's like that's their Star Wars legacy is my dad falling asleep during that and then when I took him to see Empire Strikes Back remastered in 97 he fell asleep during that too yeah so all the best ones all the Beatles man yeah oh yeah all the Beatles too yeah uh, yeah <laughs> but uh, yeah so my dad's a huge fan of Roy Orbison yeah yeah Roy Orbison's of course part of the Traveling Wilburys sure um, dies before the second album comes out yeah it's unfortunate yeah heart attack real sudden but the um, is Harris so wait I'm sorry if you've already said is Harrison your favorite member of the Traveling Wilburys uh, it's between him and Tom Petty. Okay, because mine's it, even though like as big as Beatles fans as we are, my favorite's Jeff Lynne. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, huge. He's like yeah. the unforgot. He's like the forgotten member because yeah. he's always behind the scenes, like the wizard behind the curtain. Yeah, he's also the the drummer of the Wilburys mm-hmm. and, and everything. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he's the. I think he produced both records too. That wouldn't. Yeah, that, that wouldn't surprise me. Um, because he's the only one with like. He's the one with the most production experience, even at that point. And he's the one the Beatles trust down the road, you know. Yeah. We so, have to get way down the road, but. Yeah. But so, yeah, listening to Harrison, I was like, oh, you know, obviously my dad was like, yeah, that's an all star group. And I was like, well, I recognize Roy Orbison because you don't shut the fuck up, Roy. <laughs> I'm like five years old. <laughs> <laughs> just, I could see your dad like standing over top of you, and you're just like this domineering presence, like just d- standing up to him going, I know him because you don't shut the fuck up about <laughs> him. Yeah. Who's there's Tom Petty? He's yeah. with the Heartbreakers. There's Jeff Lynne. He's with that some band. Yeah, because I don't think my dad's a huge ELO guy. <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> um, I was like, who's who's the other guitarist? And like, that's that's George Harrison. Who's George Harrison? Yeah, he's, he's with the Beatles, and that you know. Yeah, Beatles. That's how the it all started. So you hear to hear first, maybe <laughs> traveling Wilburys. <laughs> Before Beatles, and how great is it that they have Volume One and Volume Three? <laughs> yeah, they knew, they wanted to fuck with everybody. Yeah. They're like, everyone's gonna be like, "What's Volume Two? Yeah. <laughs> so For a while, my dad was like, "I can't find it in any CD shop." <laughs> <laughs> well, George, wherever you are, you got my dad. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's it's a great number, but uh, you know Indeed. what closes out um, side one? I don't remember. Tell me, can't buy me love. Oh well. There you go. That's the big bouncy, happy McCartney track there on, you go. on this album. Yeah, um, I remember he got pissed because someone asked him if this is a song about prostitution. Yeah, he was, just like, fuck he was like, "Yeah, fuck you." Yeah, like, if you ever see if McCartney pissed, like watch somebody not not even negatively talk about the Beatles, but like falsely associate, falsely yeah, falsely asso- associate something, or ask him why the <laughs> White Album's a double album. Yeah. That's the most angry you'll see McCartney. Doesn't need Wild Honey Pie, Sir Paul. No, it doesn't. <laughs> doesn't need Rocky Raccoon. I, that one, I am um, all for. Oh, I can't wait to get to that one. But uh, that'll be a whole podcast on itself. <laughs> Just the debate oh, so if good. Rocky Raccoon's a good song. It's yeah. not. No, it's, it's, it is. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, <laughs> but no, this song, though, we can agree on this song, Can't Buy Me Love. Can't Buy Me Love, great. Bouncy, happy. Buy yeah. you a diamond ring, my friend, if it makes you feel all right. Yeah. Does that make them engaged? If it make yeah, I guess. Yeah. I guess if it makes her feel all right. I mean, it's, it's, isn't that buying her love? Yeah, the song never really made sense to me. Yeah. Lyrically. Um, but money can't buy her love. I guess, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and it can't. But the uh, unless you're a sugar. Would daddy, you say this is a sugar day? Would you say this is the most iconic <laughs> like in terms of like or is it Hard Day's Night still? Hard Day's Night is I mean, if only because of the opening chord. Okay. Um, there's no like big recognizable moment or movement within Can't Buy Me Love, it's because it's set to the most iconic part of the film. The coolest thing about Can't Buy Me Love is it starts with the chorus. And that's something that 
even back then, like, again, we're like, we are so jaded by all of this now because it's like, well, of course you would start with it, you know. But for back then, to start with a chorus before a verse, like, it sounds like you're, like, Lethal Weapon 2-ing it. Like, you're coming in the middle of a song, you know, and you're like, what the fuck? And it's just little things like that. Like, just little seeds that we got planted is, like, you start with a cor- you start the song with a chorus. Boom. Yeah. There. And people are like, you can't do that. That's not how you do music. Yeah. You can do music however you want. Not 14 tracks, 13 tracks. Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Though I think there are, like, restrictions now. Like, I think an album has to be, what, at least seven songs to be not considered a full Dream Theater is probably, like, pushing the envelope with that one. But again, there, yeah. it's, like, seven tracks, but it's, like, an hour and a half long. Yeah. Yeah, six degrees of inner turbulence. Yeah. Um, God. <laughs> but, Fantastic. But, yeah, that closes out all the, the side side one, all the songs that are in the film. Yep. If you were an American listener and you bought the Capitol Records version of this album, that would be the only Beatles numbers that you would get from this album because side two would just be the score which would suck yeah what the fuck (laughs) now fortunately my mother managed to track down a cassette tape with the it was the british version which was kind of rare at the time especially for a fucking cassette yeah um so this is because she got me two cassettes because she knew i i used to like wear out the tape for a hard day's night and help Mm mm-hmm um, so she knew that those were like two things that I liked. So she got me the cassette tapes for A Hard Day's Night and Help. Yeah. The version of Help was the Capitol Records version. So I only got the songs that were in the movie and the score. At the time, obviously, I You're didn't. probably like a genius for the score. Yeah. Of, oh, for any Beatles fan <laughs> yeah. that's like under 60. But, um, <laughs> but I, that's, I didn't know any better. Sure. When I'm listening to... You should have known better, man. Yeah. With a girl like you. But <laughs> I can just I get the image again of you. And every image of anyone that I know that's younger, they have the same size head now, but a smaller body. That's can, that's impressive because I got a massive uh, dome. Yeah. Like uh, me too, my friend. But like it's uh, it's like the uh, If You're Wondering If You Want Me To video by Weezer where they all have like massive heads and little bodies. Anyway, um, I could see you like... It's like a... Uh, taking out a, sh- a used shotgun shell where you take the, the cassette out of the thing. Mom, I need another one. And you throw it. You get another hard day's night. <laughs> another uh, uh, help. Yeah, another help. <laughs> yeah. Well, so suddenly it, it's weird to me still a little having watched the film so many times before listening to the album in its entirety. And I get this effect with with help as well. But um I'm suddenly listening to songs that aren't in the film. Mm -hmm. And the first track on side two, which again is the first track not in the film, Any Time at All by John Lennon, starts out with a a hand clap immediately followed by a foot stomp, like a gunshot. And suddenly it's like Lennon saying, hey, just because these songs aren't in the fucking, didn't make the cut for the movie, don't think that they're any worse. Yeah. Um, Hand claps, man. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the only one you get, though. For mm. the for, no, you get it before every chorus, because um, every chorus has that similar kind of gunshot effect. Like yeah, boom, using that percu- like again, just using simple things to to kind of reinvent the wheel, you know. Yeah, and you listen to any time at all, and it's just like, again, it's it's this side of the album that's darker. It's this side of the album that's more atmospheric. But this is still a very up tempo track. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, I love there's kind of like a. Um, uh, a quickness, almost like a like uh, like there's a like they're not in a bad way, but like rushing, like the way he's getting the words out, you know. Yeah, anytime at all. Yeah, it's yeah. it's good, it's good stuff. And you've got um George Martin, like during the 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 bridge, you've got George Harrison and jo- the Georges, George Harrison and George Martin, the producer, who's like secretly, not so secretly, the fifth Beatle. Yeah. Because whenever they needed a keyboardist, they'd just be like, "That wasn't Billy Preston." You. <laughs> just be like. By the yeah. way, I think it might have been George uh, Martin's. I think this could be wrong, but I think it was George Martin's idea to do the chorus first and came out my love. Yeah, I think so. Possible yeah. props to you. F- fact check us, listeners. Yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah. So they've got like during the bridge, which is like this kind of like building an in intensity, this crescendo, uh, like the song itself. You've got them mimicking each other: George Harrison on the guitar, George Martin on the piano, like this big grand piano, and it's just fucking awesome mm-hmm. like it's it's a great way to kick off side two it's a great way and it you know even now listening to that track i kind of get the chills like oh we're going into not as familiar territory yeah you know it, it, it's a it's a winner oh, again i love that you know the like uh another band could have very easily have been like oh they're not gonna hear these in the movie oh don't worry about it you know we, yeah. and here's some of that filler this is all the, this all the stuff, stuff we're working out yeah, yeah yeah where yeah again like you said in a, in a 
Um, that's the kind of insight you're going to get on this, like yeah. that idea, the idea of like Lenin. Yeah, this this percussive kind of like fuck you, keep yeah. listening. Um, and then you've got a uh, you know, this album would for me be a perfect album. It would be. It would be like top to bottom pristine if it wasn't for the next song <laughs> because Jesus Christ is the next song fucking terrible tell us Sam <laughs> the next song is I'll cry instead yeah and it's just like you've got this like badass a weird fucking title too yeah it's another Lennon number um it's like this really you've got the side two kicks off of this like badass Lennon like look anytime at all I'll be there and then anytime at all I'll cry instead, instead yeah just like he's like mo- it's a song about him moping that he can't get like any girl he wants like oh, do, 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 yeah. two beers, uh, most songs just, about moping never needed to exist in the first place unless it's don't bother me by but George Harrison I'm with <laughs> the Beatles but the uh, most <laughs> the uh, and it like even musically. It doesn't make. It's not like a sad, slow number. It's like mm-hmm. a like a do 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 do. It's like the 1964 equivalent of like the Seinfeld theme, set to like Her- John Lennon lyrics. Yeah, there you go. Thank Christ, the song's less than two minutes. Yeah, it's a long. quick one. Yeah, really because quick. Because they're like, let's just get, get. We need 13 tracks. We yeah. can't. We can't come we can't up with 14. Can't even get the 14 because we ain't yeah. gonna. We ain't gonna put shit gonna, on here. Yeah, we're not gonna use Matchbox by Ringo for whatever reason. Yeah. We need to fill out our EP at the same time. We'll just do this one. It sucks. Yeah. Skip it. If you make a Beatles mix, or if you have this album on your iTunes and you're running out of space, this is the first track that goes. <laughs> <laughs> and then Rocky, Rocky, Rocky Raccoon. Right? Rocky Raccoon. Well, that's, honestly, it's not my least favorite track on the White Album. Mm-hmm. I think everyone's least favorite track on the White Album is Revolution, Revolution 9, 9, unless yeah. you're uh, Yoko Ono. Oh. Yeah, if you if you meet somebody that loves Revolution Nine, congratulations, you met Yoko Ono. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, number nine, but, yeah, number nine. That's the one. <laughs> the next track is uh, is uh, kind of McCartney's answer to any time at all. It's things we said today. Mm, yeah, which is just a, a again kind of a darker, more atmospheric number. You've got the acoustic guitars going instead of the instead of the electrics. Um, one of the things that McCartney was always impressed by is like he's like it, it's kind of like an album knowing the gravity of a conversation you're having with a loved one it's like you know we're always going to remember things that you know going into this conversation sure. the things we say are the things we're going to remember yeah. um especially it, with social media nowadays yeah and so it's a very it's a very atmospheric track it, it is it's it's kind of oddly dark for McCartney especially at this time because McCartney is so much I mean later on you get stuff again very introspective stuff long winding road let it, you know stuff that you know uh but up to this point he, he's very clearly like the upbeat shining beacon light kind of guy He's the poppy guy. Sure. Yeah, yeah, he's the cute one. Yeah. For lack of a better word or phrase or thing. But yes, this one kind of has there's a hint of something in there, you know. This It's also the only track he writes on side 2. True. Yeah. Again, Lennon dominates yeah but it's a it's a nice atmospheric little it's number. yeah it, it is a good song yeah. um but it's got this kind of uh this kind of subtle little driving kind of thing going yeah. on throughout the song kind of cool sense of melancholy yeah, i like it uh the next one is uh when i get home mm-hmm. another uh lennon track i really like this one i can see where why people wouldn't like this one as much as the rest of the album yeah it's um, it's all right it's it's again it's not one that i'm uh I got much to say on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I like I like the the vocal bridge. Mm-hmm. That for me is what sells it. Not the, not um, not Lennon doing the uh, the double track to ooh ah, like yeah. that. Just like, king of the double track. Yeah. Well, he loved the idea of a double track. Oh, yeah. He's like, oh, I don't have to sing this twice. I can just sing it. Like we'll just record it in two channels and then just overlay it on top of each other. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Like, cause he hated like. One of he was the thing he was most self critical about, uh, at least in terms of his of his uh, professional career, was his singing. Yeah, um, he was always wondering why people didn't take him more seriously as a guitarist. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, by by I guess I don't know what the phrase would be by I guess industry standards of what we especially today, um, Lennon doesn't have, and this is no knock because I think his voice is totally unique. And and iconic and fantastic, but like a pretty voice, you know, um, yeah. not not McCartney, it's almost nasally. It is, it's nasally, but it. I mean, God, has there ever been a, a better voice to match like the soul inside, you know? And and so like you get, especially like when you listen to the anthology stuff, 
Especially when you lose. I mean, I think it almost shows more so on like Plastic Ono Band. Oh yeah, Soul. Yeah, yeah. That's a. I mean, that's a fantastic album. Uh, like with tracks like Mother and stuff. But uh, he's literally screaming. Yeah. Oh man. But uh, and then Kanye tries it later on. Yeah. But uh, except he just straight up screams yeah. and then <laughs> breathes heavily and breathes between. heavily in the mic. Yeah, classic. I love that album. But uh, uh, yeah, his it, you know he would do this thing on one of the anthology tracks before he starts singing. Uh, I think either Dan and Life or Strawberry Fields, where he'd say he'd be like Sugar Plum Fairy, Sugar Plum Fairy, and then kick into it. And like Martin, George Martin was the same kind of thing, where he would, you know, if you watch these great videos and documentaries about them, he would sit there and he'd say the same thing, like you know, Lennon really didn't like his voice, but then he would play just the track of him singing from like Strawberry Fields, and it is like it's mesmerizing, it's fantastic, you know. And so I think that's something. It's very easy for people, like you know, actors, actresses. Um, d- don't want to watch their own movies because that's weird, um, you know. And it's got to be it's got to be weird, kind of, to sit there and just listen to your voice over and over again, you know. And again, when you have what, and again, you know, McCartney's my favorite Beatle, but to to have a much more conventional, uh, angelic sounding voice, you know. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's an okay track. Yeah, so yeah, it's fine. It's fine. And the next track is kind of the big, uh, the big poppy number on this one. You can't do that. Oh yeah. Kind of like the jangly guitars. Yeah. Um. Jam there was a, there was Jam a uh, prof- either a, con- a televised concert or, or more likely a public appearance where they're playing it on some like British late night show or whatever the equivalent to late night is in fucking 1964 UK, and they're playing the number and the people there's like all these people like doing like the awkward like dance they've got like the beat 60s beehive oh, hair yeah. and at that moment I realized I should have been in the 60s <laughs> I would have been awesome in the 60s uh, <laughs> I don't know if I would we're dancing yeah. Bring it, bring yeah. it. <laughs> they still, on. they still would have like put me in a mental institution if I stood <laughs> like on the Ed Sullivan show. Like it's like Chrononauts, so you go back in time, yeah, and like all the screaming girls, and there's just two, <laughs> two like thirty year old men, yeah, wearing like, like shirts that don't make any sense to the era that they're in, yeah, yeah, uh, and they're just Dressed like Marty McFly when he first gets to 1885, yeah, like the big pink fucking outfit, yeah, yeah. It's like this is what cowboys wear, <laughs> yeah, and just just going insane and just being hauled off, yeah. By yeah. the police. One fluke over the cuckoo's nest. Mm. I'll smash out Just, the window. Could, and you, run could you imagine like going back in time to like this era, of the Beatles, yeah. and being like, they're gonna grow mustaches, their hair long, yeah, do lots of drugs, yeah, and with these double album, a double album, and go like this is the you know, and people would be like, what the fuck? And also like, again, like we stress so much in like what is the early Beatles time frame. Like even the Beatles, like people at the same time were like, "How long is this gonna last?" Like, because every band had this like they'd only in- been around for a little over a year, insanely short lifespan. Like every yeah. band, you know. And again, the it, Beatles yeah. are like breaking down doors, trailblazing and stuff. But at the same time, everyone's going like, "Okay, okay." But then again, they keep releasing. Just yeah. the amount of work they're releasing is so insane. They had been big in the U.S. for about five months. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when you know I want to hold your hand comes over on the other side of the Atlantic, and that's the song because they had been trying to break into the because it's a huge fucking market. They had been trying to break into the U.S. market basically since they started, and you know they send over "Love Me Do" and initially it doesn't do as well as they hope. They send over, uh, you know, they record "From Me to You" that does great in the U.K. So does "Please Please Me." Doesn't really, you know, break you know doesn't really break into the uh, into the U.S. market. They mm-hmm. send over. I want to hold your hand, and everyone's like, "Oh fuck!" Like that's the <laughs> that's the uh, stop the process. Yeah, that's the ba- the baby by Justin Bieber. That's the equivalent track. That's the breakthrough. Um, and then all the other tra- singles that they had sent suddenly by proxy went up. I'm glad you said that because I always try to like explain it to my sister or just other people, where I'm like, "Look, what the Beatles did, like their transformation, is the equivalent of a Bieber or a One Direction." Here's the thing. I like Bieber. Like, I like early Bieber can I like one direction. Early Bieber can suck a dick. Yeah. Bieber himself can personally suck a dick, <laughs> but he's probably good at it. <laughs> the um probably already done it. The uh, probably doing it right now. Yeah. The um music he's doing now, how he's transformed musically. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, again, One Direction is kind of doing it too, and people right now are going, "Hi, if I got talking about Bieber and One Direction on a Beatles podcast, fuck you, listen to me." <laughs> I'm going to tell you why, because it, again, you know, Britpop, literally, and then like kind of like you know the, the baby, baby, kind of like you know pop, whatever. But yeah, douche or not, 
with the with with you know One Direction, they seem to be like more grounded and cooler than Bieber. Yeah, uh, actually, definitely more grounded and cooler. Harry Styles is pretty cool, and then I like the one guy who Harry Styles, man, doesn't he look kind of like a young, young Jagger? Jagger? Yeah. yeah, and my sister's like, no, and I show her a young picture of Jagger. She's like, no, because she knows what he looks like now. He's got the massive lips. Yeah, I'm like, that's what he's gonna look like soon. <laughs> um, but no, I think when you know One Direction's, you know, they're they're doing a more rock thing, but yeah, is the equivalent of Bieber and One Direction. I'm gonna use One Direction because I like One Direction more than Bieber in this instance. One Direction, right? And I also like the guy, uh, I'm blanking on his name now, the guy who inspired uh, Robbie Reyes. He quit. Oh, uh, 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 is it uh, Z- 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 Zane. Uh, Zane? Zane. Zane, yeah. He's, which, for all you kind of cork in it, there. Zane. Yeah. He has uh, inspiration for Robbie Reyes from Ghost Rider, the all new Ghost Rider. Anyway, he's not in the band anymore, so fuck him. Uh, no, not really. So, One Direction, right? I'm it, sure he's making sweet music. I'm sure he's doing wonderful things. Um, so, so it, like, One Direction. Does all this music, right? And they're kind of doing this. They're taking a break, right? They are really doing this. So they take a break. Yeah. And well, they all like, showed up on the James Corden show this oh, week. Oh, did they? Okay. So they take a break, and everyone's like, fuck them. They're dead. You know, the other bands will come and take the place. And then a couple months down the line, right, they come back with fucking beards and facial hair. And I would say long hair, but Harry Styles always, already has that rock and long hair. And they release an album that's, like, mind-blowing, right? That, like, even the die-hard pitchfork media s- hipsters can't can't not give a good reviews right they can't be like oh they're just some other pop yeah. group and they're like where the fuck did this come from and then yeah. they release like four or five albums after that just blow your mind that's to put it in perspective now of the, minus let it be yeah yeah um yeah they kind of go backwards <laughs> on that one but like to put it in perspective now like that's kind of what it was like for the beatles like you know yes girls loved it but you know were, were, it was every guy's favorite band the beatles probably not in the early 60s because they probably liked them because girls liked them you know and they'd be like hey put on the beatles whatever but then for them to come out of nowhere and release you know who's in the uh climactic concert hmm. who's like was a legit beatles fan i'm sure still is elvis costello uh no phil collins oh he's in the uh audience as, you know, just a lad. Good job with the, the Tarzan soundtrack, brah. Yeah. Just blasting it. Enjoy the head Oscar. Yeah. You know, the Beatles won a Grammy for uh, for this album. Did they? Yeah. Fantastic. I think for uh, more specifically. Is this their first Grammy? Holidays. I think so. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right around then. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think for the title track for best vocal performance. Mm. Um, but no, I mean, it, it's a it's a. It's a humdinger of a track. You can't do that. <laughs> humdinger. It was, you know, Zinger. They, they filmed a performance of it, a mime performance of it for the film, but I think they decided they decided to go with um, just uh, they just they put in "She Loves You" instead because obviously yeah, well, it's the go. biggest fucking song in yeah. the UK in their entire history. Uh, what closes it out is, and I love this, is "I'll Be Back," another mm-hmm. John Lennon track. Dark, back to acoustic, back to moody. Um, and you know, obviously, it's as an album closer, it's a good you know you know I'll be back, and they would sure. be with uh, the Beatles for a return. Beatles for sale, man. But um, the uh, if you listen to the exiting to the outro, the second to last chord, they play. I don't know how to communicate this. Mm. It's not played. Act wrong. it out, and I'll and I'll and I'll. And I'll do. <laughs> it's not played <laughs> wrong. Yeah, it's they add. Somehow add an a deliberate air of indecision, undecisive indecisiveness okay. to that last chord. Like I'll be, you know, almost like as a question, I'll be back. Yeah. So when you listen to that album, listen to that second, just fucking listen to the outro. Yes. Listen to that and you'll delete. Hear. I'll cry. Um, I'll cry instead. I'll cry instead. It's a minute and forty five seconds. Yeah, you'll be fine. You you've got better things to do in and, life. And then listen to that second to last chord. Yeah. Um, and the first chord. Yeah, well, just to get an idea, I've listened to the entire outro. Sure, but the uh, yeah, I mean, again, this is uh, it's it's one of my favorite albums of all time. It's it's probably my favorite Beatles album. I'm sure nostalgia clouds a lot of that. You could argue nostalgia clouds. It a lot does, of but for a guy that doesn't have as much nostalgia <laughs> as you do with it, it's yeah. still one of the top of the early and one of the top uh, you know of all time for me. You know, I've uh, and I've probably said it before. Like, I'm much more of a, of a later. Beatles guy, but oh yeah, again I've listened to those albums. I love those albums. Might sure, let it be. But yeah, the yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can't stress that enough either. But um, yeah, but yeah, no, it is it is a humdinger of an album. It's fantastic. Yeah, so check it out. Watch the film. I think it's available on Vudu. If it's not, get the Blu-ray. Do Fuck it. it. It's awesome. Just right. this is the Beatles album. This is where the Beatles, for, in my mind, become the Beatles. But we're not done with them yet. No, not even close. This has been another installment I want to tell you 
I'm Sam. I'm Jake. We'll be back. Bye.